So hello and welcome to SOCAP's 2021 session on how Latin America's entrepreneurs are creating a new and better innovation economy. My name is Jen Stuhler Rivera, and I'm the Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility for Moody's Corporation. And I'm thrilled to be here today moderating the panel on two of my favorite topics, Latin America and entrepreneurs. Before I have the panelists introduce themselves, I'd like to share uh, just a brief um, summary of Moody's CSR and our Reshape Tomorrow initiative. In 2018, Moody's announced our Reshape Tomorrow Financial Empowerment Initiative, which focused on bringing tools, skills, and knowledge to people at every level of the market to promote greater prosperity and opportunity. By supporting underserved uh, communities, we can help fuel economic inclusion and job growth and help markets work better for more people. One of our founding partners selected for the Reshape Tomorrow initiative was Village Capital. And over the last three years, Moody's has partnered with Village Capital to deliver a capacity building program that gives entrepreneurs the tools to grow successful businesses. Since our partnership was formed, entrepreneurs in the region have started to gain significant attention from investors. This sets the stage for Latin American entrepreneurs to impact society's most pressing issues across financial services, agriculture, healthcare, and more. I'll now turn it over to each of our panelists to introduce themselves. And Matt, let's go ahead and start with you. If you could please tell us a little bit about Village Capital, the work going on in Latin America, and your role with the organization. Sure. Thanks so much, Jen, and it's good to be with you all. Um, my name is Matt Zieger, the Chief Program Officer for the Americas at Village Capital. Um, uh, we're based in D.C. in the U.S., but have offices around the world um, or locations around the world now these days. Uh, and we've operated for 12 years uh, globally to find, train, and invest in uh, underserved entrepreneurs that have an outsized impact on important social and environmental problems. Um, partnerships with Moody's and others around the world really enable this. And so we look to really thoughtful um, corporate leaders and founders and funders um, to help us uh, power this kind of work to find, uh, find these entrepreneurs that are not finding support in other ways. Um, my particular role uh, covers all of our kind of entrepreneur and programmatic facing work, external facing work for across uh, the U.S. and Latin America, where we started our office um, back in 2015. Um, and Daniel is our regional director for Latin America, so I'm going to turn it over to Daniel. Thank you so much, Matt, Jen, Marina. Um, so yes, I'm Daniel Cosian, the regional director for Village Capital in Latin America where we've supported over 45 entrepreneurs together with Moody's over the past years. So this is something really exciting for us, um, especially as we explore different trends, such as the future of work, financial services, and really uh, trying to support and supporting entrepreneurs that are making sure that there are services for people that are, have been left outside for many years, um, particularly minority communities. And this is something that we're really glad to, to be working on together. Um, I work with a very, talented team here in Mexico City. We also have uh, uh, one team member in Paraguay at the moment. And this is part of what we try to do in terms of building networks of support in different countries. So it's not really just us traveling to different countries and trying to, to, um, to do what we think is best, but surrounding our, our, our uh, teams with uh, the knowledge and also people that understand the local context. And this is what I would say is the main strength that we have as an organization. Um, so really happy to be here uh, today and really happy to be working with you for the past years. And I'm going to turn it to Marina. Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Marina Rosenberg. I am the country manager for Argentina and uh, for Moody's local and MIS operation. And I'm also the commercial head for Latin America. As you might already know, Moody's uh, is, uh, I mean, our core business is to do credit rating assessments, uh, credit rating analysis. We provide ratings for companies, for sovereigns, for anyone that wants uh, to provide better transparency and uh, that wants to access the capital markets and broaden the number of investors willing to uh, buy their securities. But, I mean, I'm not sure that this is the right focus of what we are talking about today. So maybe... I want to get the core of what we do, which is bring transparency and uh, information to the market. So I would think that, I mean, the, the better way to match our business to what we're doing here and the purpose of this conversation today is that we, we try to bring clarity, fairness and knowledge to an interconnected world. 
So we are committed to supporting the social, environmental, and financial health of Latin American communities through our business endeavors in local corporate social responsibility programs. So that's the idea. The, I mean, the partnership with Village Capital has worked amazingly well for both of us, I'm willing and looking forward to share more of that throughout the panel. Back to you, Jen. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. We've got a really nice agenda of questions over the next 40 minutes. So I'm just going to jump right in. Um, the first couple questions are for any of you to, to jump in with an answer. So uh, we'll throw it out there and, and take turns. So Latin America is considered an emerging market by many. What is your response when you hear that? I can start, um, and then I can I can uh, pass it to Matt, uh, who's also uh, in a unique position because uh, he's not only working with the team in the U.S. but also the team in Latin America, and this allows for contrast and also uh, you know to identify different trends in the different countries and the regions. Um, so when we talk about emerging, emerging sometimes means and and it's seen as a place where there's no opportunity or infrastructure. Or even networks, right? And that is that is the connotation that is often given to different um, terms, to different uh, trends as well. But what I identify as emerging is opportunity. And Latin America, and and it is great that investors outside the region have already started to see this. Is a, a land where people really try to build different products and services that are not for uh, I would say the upper classes. Uh, that are for people for to use, you know, in everyday lives. So, for example, a clear example of that is we train a company that is uh, focused on managing payments for different services. And in a country like Mexico, I'm sure in Argentina is, is similar in Brazil, probably the same. Um, it is really hard to go out and really pay for services, right? Uh, and this is something that we struggled with during the pandemic last year. Um, this company is actually one company that I, you know, I, I use their services to, to be able to protect me and my family. And this is the type of work that people are uh, developing in the region. So it's not these luxurious items or these luxurious services, but it is products that are useful for people to make their lives easier today. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Matt, uh, who I'm sure has more impressions about it. Uh, a couple of thoughts come to mind when people say emerging, and Daniels uh, always likes to remind our team that um, it's they're no longer emerging. Latin America really, and, and particularly some of the larger markets um, like Mexico and Brazil um, uh, are, are leading markets, obviously. I think uh, we look at things like a gross domestic product per capita. Um, and, and a surprising statistic is, is uh, uh, Mexico, Brazil, other larger Latin American countries, and it really as a whole, the GDP per capita is actually closer to places like China than it is um, to places like Kenya, where we also operate, um, or India even. So it's it's um, dramatically higher um, GDP per capita, as well as the, the amount of deals that are happening right now. Um, so we track a lot of the VC and investment statistics because it's, it often is uh, very relevant to our companies. Um, and right now in, in Mexico, we're looking, we're on target to uh, to hit a thousand a uh, thousand deals uh, in uh, in about in about twenty five billion dollars invested in startups, um, and uh, that's uh, running at like two hundred percent of what it was last year, um, and and continuing to see that kind of increase. So, um, lots of ways to think about it, but um, I, I, you know, it's no longer emerging. Certainly has emerged um, and is really leading in a lot of interesting ways. So, I wonder what uh, Maureen has to say about. That or uh, it's interesting because we all have a different perspective depending on our backgrounds. I mean, when we talk about emerging, I mean, I think about the concept associated to high growth potential, but high risk associated to that potential. I think about GDP. I think about, I mean, this concept for me implies a transition between a less developed to a more developed region. So I clearly hear your, your points and I understand that if we look from, a, I mean, if we, if we, analyze uh, emerging uh, by looking at opportunities, network infrastructure, investment, growth. Uh, this is, I mean, LATAM is definitely leading, but also I would like to bring another factor to the table that has to do with equality, equal access to opportunities. And I think that there is a place here where Latin America still is lagging a little bit behind uh, other regions. I see that there is huge, huge talent capabilities, entrepreneurship, great ideas, but I still perceive that access to capital, access to 
um, the opportunity to develop these ideas is still limited. It's not fair. It's not equal. So capital still becomes a limitation. It happens. I mean, I would translate these to every um, every area of the economy. I mean, the, the, this is something that we see across all sectors. And for example, from our perspective, from a Moody's perspective, we still see that from uh, credit quality will remain strong in the region despite weaker growth prospects. So this is a region that has been threatened repeatedly by macroeconomic imbalances. I mean, you name it, depending on the country, inflation is a ghost that appears in all the regions. Um, so it's a very uneven and stop and go, depending, of course, and with each economy, there are outliers in the region. Chile has shown an excellent uh, macroeconomic story, but it's a region with imbalances and with stop and go in terms of growth. So that turns access, uh, I mean, that brings access and equality to a different perspective uh, that has, I mean, I still see an emerging feature when we talk about access and equality, but definitely I should agree with you, Matt, that in terms of the number of startups and investment in in this, I mean, we've doubled, we've seen the beast doubling. So this is amazing, and the region here is definitely leading. We would need a little bit more of support from investors in order to make it happen, but that's another topic. <laughs> Great, well, different different uh, perspectives, but I think the common uh, theme here is that Latin America is certainly leading, um, and that leads me into my next question, which maybe. Um, Matt, you might want to kick us off, or Daniel. Why are Latin American entrepreneurs continuing to attract such growing volumes of investment? I'll touch. I'll touch on this briefly. Um, so, one of the things that's interesting, I think, about Latin America broadly, uh, when compared to some of the other markets in which we operate, um, is uh, the the scale and speed of growth. So um, it's both, uh, you know, kind of as a whole, is about double the population of the United States and also growing at considerably higher rates. Um, and yet the um, kind of informal nature of large sections of the economy is still very persistent. I think, I think Marina, to your point about the quality and equity um, and really access to economic opportunity uh, distributed throughout the region, um, it's, it's very... Um, it's a very two-tiered society in ways that, that, that I think e even many other markets um, still are not. And so um, when you do have solutions like Daniel was talking about that can solve for something like an, the underbanked um, population that's um, uh, less than 50, uh, more than 50 percent of the population is underbanked. And, and that's comparison to, to most other major markets of similar size. That's like 80 or 90 percent in most places like China or India. Um, so you have a huge demand and need um, for innovation that improves lives, that changes the way businesses are created or formed. Um, and you also have this massive scale of adoption. Um, so I think the two, those two things together, I think, are, are very attractive for investors and, and anyone that are thinking about ways to scale um, uh, and distribute products as well as really meet demand and need in the society. So. I definitely would agree with you. I mean, that's a huge opportunity if you look at the region potential in terms of number of people and opportunities in the under banks population. I mean, this is also a population that's not served. I mean, that cannot access the traditional ecosystem of payments, so it needs to have specific solutions to address that doesn't have access to credit. So, I mean, the impact on any solution to better position these underserved uh, people is huge. And I would also add, I mean, why is LATAM attractive? Because there's a lot of talent. And compared to, I mean, productivity is relatively good. Talent is very high. I mean, you have very highly educated people that you can hire at a very attractive cost. So for companies, I mean, you, there are still uh, hubs that remain very attractive in terms of capacity to attract talent, to retain talent and cost efficient. Uh, in Latin America, we have two of them. One of them is Argentina, the other one is Costa Rica. And many companies are shifting towards uh, settling cost of cost efficient operations because we find talent, productivity, and relatively attractive in terms of cost. So that would be my addition, my two cents to, to your views, Matt. Excellent. Thanks, Marina. 
So um, maybe, Daniel, can you tell us a little bit about Finance Forward and how partnerships uh, like the Finance Forward between Moody's, Village Capital, um, how is that helping innovation that's helping you know, some of the most pressing needs uh, for small businesses in Latin America? So just tell us a little bit more about that program. Yeah, yeah, of course. So Finance Forward is uh, a program where we support entrepreneurs coming from all places in Latin America. And I would say that the most important uh, part of this relates to what Marina was uh, sharing earlier in, in, in the conversation. It is about access. It is about creating equal opportunities. Um, so we've created a Village Capital, a set of uh, criteria where we care about the business and we care about what the potential of this business is. We don't really care about what your background is in terms of uh, college uh, you know, degrees or even graduate education, or if you belong to a capital city where capital, of course, uh, funds are concentrated. So think of Sao Paulo, think of Mexico City, think of uh, Buenos Aires in, in some cases, or Santiago. Um, what we want to, to do here is to make it equitable for entrepreneurs to access the opportunity to one, grow their businesses, train them as, a, as founders, and third, uh, opening more uh, networks for them to attract investment, whether it's debt or it's uh, equity in, in this way. So Finance Forward is a set of different workshops where we uh, partner with Moody's uh, and we have partnered with Moody's across different countries in, in Latin America to provide not only mentorship, which is very specialized. And I would say that what Moody's is adding to this um, initiative is this risk assessment analysis that comes with the different expertise levels that you all have as, as Moody's uh, staff members, of course, um, but also helping entrepreneurs think of opportunities along with risks. So we have a clear example with some offices in some people in offices uh, like Buenos Aires or uh, even uh, Sao Paulo. We, we went back uh, to Buenos Aires. I think it was the end of 2019, 20 before uh, this whole thing happened. And I remember uh, seeing Marina in there with a couple of entrepreneurs, and it was a really good exercise. These two entrepreneurs have been awarded as the best um, suited to attract investment from uh, different capital sources. And I remember this particular session because Marina was there along with uh, 15 other uh, peers. And I remember that uh, the founders, one of them from Chile, the other one from Sao Paulo, were like, yes, this is really helpful in, in you know, in, in, getting all this feedback because we're always told to fundraise. We're always told how great the company is. But when you get someone that is particularly specialized at risk, you truly find what you need to work on as an entrepreneur. So Finance Forward is something that uh, really helped entrepreneurs uh, advance in, in this way, in their investment readiness. But I would say that the most important part of Finance Forward is also trying to expand the concept of financial health and expand the, the concept of uh, supporting individuals and families. So Latin America as a whole has been you know, all about financial inclusion for the past, I would say, five years. Uh, I would say from 2015 to 2019. So fin financial health, when we talk about it, is okay. Financial inclusion means getting a bank account, getting access to credit, and that's it. But what's after that? And this is something that we've worked on together, identifying entrepreneurs, supporting them, and also trying to uh, open these options for them and also for investors, as Marina was saying, capital allocation is really important here um, to understand what the concept is about. It is not just about one transaction. It is not a one-off uh, interaction between the customer and the client, but it is about creating a path for individuals and families to one, save, invest, and grow their businesses. And this is the most important part about Finance Forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Marina, I've got a follow-up question to, to that for you. So. What role can corporates like Moody's play in supporting a healthy and diverse startup ecosystem in, in Latin America? And I think Daniel touched on this a little bit, but if you can maybe just expand from, from the corporate perspective. Sure, sure. I think that Daniel has touched many interesting points. Uh, maybe we can follow up later. But I mean, Moody's joined the Finance Forward 2019 program in Latin America to support entrepreneurs that are um, changing the way that MSMEs um, and individuals use financial services. So this collaboration among Village Capital, MetLife Foundation, PayPal, and Moody's aim to build financial help in communities across LATAM by lifting up new entrepreneurial solutions, particularly local solutions to local problems. 
we aim to move beyond um, financial inclusion to achieve financial resilience and stability for individuals and families around the world. So small business owners constantly face stressful financial, financial situations, as Danielle was mentioning. So we know that only 45% of MSMEs in Latam survive longer than two years of operation as opposed to 80% in Europe. This is extremely relevant. I mean, we need to provide MSMEs in LATAM with tools that they need to thrive. Overall, these companies generate 28% of economic activity and they are underserved. So we need to think about creative solutions to help them and help them survive longer than two years and at least reach out to the levels of their peers in other regions. I mean, even for Moody's, Latin America is a completely different region, completely different animal from the rest of the world. Local markets have very specific dynamics, and it's important to understand local nuances and local needs and have creative mind thinking about solutions to serve this market. Indeed, for us, I mean, Moody's has recently launched a new platform, a new business model to address local markets. It's a new brand called Moody's Local. So we had to adapt our business model, calibrate our methodologies to understand and perceive local risks. So I truly echo what Daniel was saying about the importance of having a partner like Moody's that we can um, use our expertise and provide this risk assessment perspective, which is very helpful for them. They are used to receiving praises on their great ideas, but it's important because when you're going to face a round of capital or several as many successful startups have done, it's important to understand and have the view of an investor and risk assessment is one of the key factors. So. I mean, at Moody's, our commitment to CSR is quite simple. We seek to open the door to a better future for people around the globe. Simple, straightforward. When our actions individually and together as a company give people more access to opportunity, we are happy. Our partnership with Village Capital is part of that commitment to empower SMEs and uh, SMEs owners, sorry, and, and growing business knowledge, resources, confidence. These people need to create a better future. It's part of our Moody's Reshape Tomorrow Empowerment Initiative. It's part of our DNA, DNA transparency, knowledge. So this commitment is not only financial, not only financial grants, but we offer time commitment from our employees that want to share their expertise and through their enthusiasm and leadership we partnered together and we have volunteered uh, for the last three years together, offering feedback sessions, acting as mock board members and reviewing specific project proposals. So through a real commitment focused on the financial health of different entrepreneurs in LATAM, companies can play a key role in boosting our economy. That's the key message we want to make. We want to generate prosperity for underserved communities especially, so happy to partner together with Village Capital. Thanks, Marina. Uh, Matt or, or Daniel, so Marina touched on the succession rate um, or the success rate rather for uh, small businesses in Latin America. Could you maybe just touch on what are some of the common problems that you see entrepreneurs are facing um, in the region? And if you could provide some specific examples, that'd be great. I'll say broadly, um, but then I'd, I'd love Daniel to jump in with some specifics of companies that are even part of this program, maybe. Um, uh, I think uh, I think very much to Marina's point, I think uh, access is really a, a, quite a challenge. And I think this is kind of a, the story and maybe the narrative of a lot of this is that um, uh, equal access across uh, geographies and communities throughout Latin America is, um, if I would say even more of a challenge than in, than most other emerging markets, um, and, and that there is this kind of uh, informal economy that is so kind of structured and is such a large part of society, um, and so I think that particularly uh, plays it plays itself out in um, disconnection in networks for capital providers early, particularly for capital, um, and also all of the ways in which uh, companies need to kind of form and grow and connect into larger ecosystems in order to succeed. Um, so uh, people have heard of it obviously the friends and family round uh, gap or other kinds of financing gaps that are early on. Um, that's a very dramatic um, gap in, in, in most countries in Latin America. Um, I think uh, the, the difference between major capital markets um, and not, not non-major capital markets like we've talked about here is, is, is quite broad um, and having those companies be able to, to, to come from other countries and tap uh, communities and tap into some of those larger networks um, is very challenging. And I, I think, so uh, those are a few things I think that come to mind, uh, lots of others, but Daniel, others that come to mind that you want to talk about some, some examples. Yeah, 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 I would just like to touch on something that's really important that has changed over the past three years 
mainly, which is entrepreneurs, uh, particularly those that are uh, growing startups, used to go to places like the US, like London, uh, France, Spain, to fundraise. And that's changing, right? And, and this is uh, part of what, in terms of power dynamics, has been changing. As we were talking about potential, as we were talking about infrastructure in the region, um, now you have uh, venture capital funds coming to Latin America. And this is good news, right? Because in the end, while capital has been concentrated for the past years, and yes, it, it's been very uh, challenging to access these networks, and really it is, it is, it is a, a closed network uh, most of the times, this is changing. Um, and this is good news for the ecosystem, right? Because if you, if you want as a huge fund to have good returns on that, then you need someone to start the journey. And where, that's where the seed funds appear. And for seed, seed, seed funds to appear, then you have to have the different diversification in, in, you know, in the journey. And this is being positive in Latin America. Uh, with regards to what's been happening with the SME ecosystem, small business uh, uh, ecosystem, one of the main challenges that they go through and that entrepreneurs have been trying to work on and solve is actually knowing uh, what they need to do in terms of financials, right? But that's not going to be addressed by a startup giving you a platform and that's it. No. And this is part of the financial health uh, concept. This is addressed by startups creating solutions and products that are based and that are created in, in their language. So if we think of a small business in Chile, of a small business in Central America, just think of a, a small mom and pop shop. They already have enough to do during the day, right? Uh, stock up uh, going to uh, Central de Bastos, to these major ware warehouses in, in the region, they already have enough to even be financial experts. And this is something that's been changing in the past five years. In 2016, 2017, you would see startups working towards uh, providing services to SMEs and creating su super complex uh, platforms that only if you had a major or, or even if you have uh, a financial postgraduate degree, then you can understand it and then you can plug numbers. And yes, it, it is easy in that way, right? But something that's been changing is actually understanding that people don't have to be experts at doing anything, right? In terms of investing, in terms of uh, managing your finances, you only need a platform that is friendly, that is usable, and that goes, uh, you know, high, hand by hand with uh, what the user needs. And this has been changing. We have a platform. Uh, that's called CFO Remoto. We supported that company in 20, 2019. Um, and they really understood that they're based in Chile. Uh, they, they understood the journey and they didn't just want to create a, a nice dashboard and, and that's it. No, they actually developed the product with people that had small businesses. Understanding, and Philippe was mentioning this, understanding that they already have enough to do. And this has been ch changing. You have invest, investment platforms in here that no longer require you to be a finance, a financial expert, or even an advisor. And that's been changing, and that's, that's good because we see improvements in the way that entrepreneurs are thinking through their problems to solve different challenges that are you know, common to families and SMEs in particular. Mm -hmm. So that, that leads me to a follow-up question that, that you just touched on here, and maybe I'll ask Matt to address this. So um, when we think about fundraising and, and capital, we know that the vast majority of capital dollars in the region is going to Mexico and Brazil. So how can we ensure that more dollars are, are going to the other countries in the region? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think um, I mean, there's obviously a lot of activity growing in, across the region and in other hubs. And we've talked on in a number of these, obviously, uh, Santiago and others, Argentina. Um, I, I think what... Um, one of the ways, you know, one of the ways I think we we approach uh, uh, making sure that there is access uh, are programs like this and partnerships with Moody's is creating pathways that are um, agnostic uh, to location um, and really finding and, and spending time seeking out networks that are on the ground uh, in, in more disconnect, disconnected communities with underserved entrepreneurs. Um, so uh, not to toot our own horn, I guess, but I think that, I think it's critical that there are con there continues to be uh, accelerator and early stage uh, support programs that are accessible throughout the region, um, particularly in communities that are underserved or smaller communities. Um, I think that's uh, that's one uh, one critical piece. I think uh, you know from a macro standpoint, I think many um, you know particularly uh, countries like Mexico are quite similar. To, they're similar doing business 
they have a similar kind of regulatory climate um, to the U.S., particularly even now they continue to kind of advance labor regulations and other standards that I think the banking community and investment community, it's fairly easy to do business in Mexico. Um, it's not so easy to do business in Brazil, um, and it's not so easy to do business in some other countries. And so I think um, continuing to find, uh, obviously, Moody's is very involved in this, um, thinking about the, the risk of doing business in different countries and kind of pricing that in and understanding how to provide additional support to companies that are within those regions that are just very hard, whether it's for currency fluctuations or legal risk or other things. Um, uh, and so I think that's um, that we have to talk about that as obviously another distribution risk for access in, in, in the region uh, where it's very disproportionately you know, affects certain folks and not others. Um, so those are those are two things that come to mind. Well, shifting shifting gears a little bit, let's let's talk about um, lessons learned. So, Marina, I'm going to go to you for this one. Um, what has Moody's learned from partnering with an organization like Village Capital? So many things, <laughs> but first of all, I mean, why I, I want to highlight why we're working with Village Capital. I mean, Moody's is a company that really cares about reputation that we value and we select carefully our partners for everything. So I think that Village Capital in its nature, in that sense, its DNA has core values, shares core, core values with us. I mean, I'm gonna pick up some things that Danielle mentioned throughout the conversation. I mean, financial inclusion goes together with our CSR values. I mean, looking at business potential, businesses that create impact on local communities, especially underserved ones. Diversity, this is something that we've learned and we really like from the selection process of village capital projects. I mean, they look at the, they don't look at the educational level of the founders, but they look at the fact that are there women in the, in, in the, among founders or in the executive committees or that are gonna have management positions. So we, I mean, we, we are uh, on board with these um, diversity uh, policies as well. And the fact that we seek at creating networks that enable people to grow, grow because of learning more financially or connecting with people that are going to help them develop the potential of their business. So what we've learned, we've learned that there is so much potential, so much opportunity, so much creativity that we're not aware of, I mean, traditionally our business gets in contact with companies that are well evolved. And are, when you're about to access the debt capital market, either domestically speaking or internationally speaking, you're a more mature company. So seeing all this universe of startups and their needs also helps us to understand the products that we need to develop in order to serve these markets, in order to serve these companies, to understand different, I mean, there's totally different shift, I mean, the, the, the needs of these companies in terms of funding is completely different, their potential, their stage, startups are totally a different animal. So it helps us getting feedback or getting a different view to understand better, to create better products, to, in some cases, think about getting input for methodologies. I mean, to rethink our business and be able to serve not only large companies or well-established companies, but also smaller companies. I mean, something I remember the meeting that Daniel is, is talking about. I mean, we we had a few entrepreneurs that came and they were very happy and pitching their companies like as if they were to pitch an investor. They were expecting a very smooth meeting and all of us starting asking questions about risk profile, business potential, um, cost structure, like everything that we look at when we do a credit rating. It was a little bit overwhelming, but I think that overall it was very positive. So I think that that's the contribution that we can, the optics where we can help. We understand what investors look at, how they look at things, how they uh, think about investment, what they are seeking for. So it's important to be able to convey that view. Uh, to local entrepreneurs and also uh, it's important to share the good vibes and make sure that they get the motivation that they need because from for a startup to start a round of, with investors can be a little bit challenging can be a little bit threatening so it's important that the moral side of the story and we learn a lot of course and there are many many great ideas we've been in contact and we did follow-ups with many of the projects that we have been working with. I mean, a few Brazilian entrepreneurs contacted us because they might be potentially seeking at or needing a rating in the future. So it's a great partnership for us. We learn more than what we give. I mean, that always happens whenever we do a CSR activity. We 
go to the activity thinking that we're going to be helping and we receive more than what we were expecting and more than what, what we've given. But it's a very positive uh, experience for us. So thank you for that. I want to publicly thank Village Capital for the opportunity of working together and Jen for enabling all this. Oh, thanks, Marina. Of course, um, you know, it was really the success of the LATAM program and Finance Forward um, that prompted Moody's to continue to expand our support with Village Capital. And that employee engagement perspective was so important. We, we received such wonderful feedback from our colleagues, um, which Marina just articulated that it was a win-win situation. Um, so, so we're now, you know, we've expanded into the U.S., we've expanded into Africa, uh, side by side with Village Capital. So it's been it's been a wonderful partnership. But um, staying in the lines of uh, lessons learned, Daniel, uh, Village Capital has been operating in Latin America for seven years now. Uh, what lessons uh, have you learned? about supporting entrepreneurs in, in Latin America and, you know, sort of just given the last 18 months with COVID, would love to hear uh, some of your thoughts around that. Yeah, thank you, Jen. So the first one, what have we learned about it? Um, I would say that we are reminded that, and we often tell founders that the, the founders are not the startups, right? And that they also need to take care of themselves. And it, it is also related to what Marina was saying that if, we have a session that is particularly hard, but never disrespectful because this is not the, the way that we do things. But hard. we prefer to tell them and we prefer to let them know when we're working together than having them go out and having you know investors or other uh, entities tell them something that they, they could have been prepared for. So this is what uh, we've learned over the past seven years to understand that one, there are people, that their people are not the same as, you know, the startups they have their own identity they also need support and we're here to support them so this is why we take very seriously the work that we do so every single session that we have every single program that we launch it is not with the intention to just you know be published on different outlets but it is with the intention of understanding that if they do well in their business the region is going to do well and in the end our families are going to do well so this is what we've learned, that it is not just about having different sessions, different programs, but it, but go, it goes beyond that. Um, and related to COVID, so this is really, um, I, I would say that, of course, it was it was hard to uh, understand and also to know what they could do next. But uh, startups are, I would say, one of the most risky asset classes, if you think of it that way. So uncertainty is part of their DNA. And something that we saw last year was that they, of course, they had, the, when I remember March 2020, and I'm sure everyone remembers, right? But March 2020, we were just finding out about the news that we, there are some lockdowns, that there are some businesses, particularly the ones that are focused on agriculture and also consumer, um, that they were shutting down, they're having issues. They probably took one or two weeks to adjust and they continued. Some other businesses really pivoted to other different sectors to other different solutions. Um, others, uh, especially the ones that are digital based, saw uh, an increase in, in terms of uh, uh, customer growth, which is good uh, because it means that what they wanted to develop in the end helped people. Um, but as I think through it, uh, we had some sessions with founders from not only the past three years, but six years, seven years, trying to figure out how can we support them? Because it's not enough to tell me, yeah, this is gonna be fine and just hold on. But asking them, hey, what do you need in terms of investor support, in terms of staff support? And at some point we even we even went uh, to them saying, hey, think of us Village Capital as extra staff members of your team. And whatever we can do in two or three weeks, please let us know. Because uh, we were in a sort of comfortable position. They were already, uh, struggling with uncertainty before, and this was just a huge hit on them. But I would say that something that Latin Americans have uh, in particular is the capacity and also the ability to adapt and to mm -hmm. build solutions out of different things that probably were aimed for a different function. And this is why entrepreneurs, particularly the Argentinian ones, are great because they adapt under different circumstances and no matter the context. Mm -hmm. 
So just uh, playing off of that a little bit, um, Matt would love your perspective from from a global perspective. Uh, you know, Village Capital is is obviously a global organization. I touched a little bit upon the Moody's expansion into some of the other markets like the U.S. and Africa, but you're also in Europe, um, MENA, South Africa. How do you see uh, the Latin uh, Latin American market um, being different from those other regions that Village Capital is working with across the world? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, so we operate, we have um, offices and fairly large teams um, in Nairobi and Southeast Asia, covering many countries throughout Africa, um, uh, through Southeast Asia, like you said, in the Middle East and Europe. Uh, now we have a, a, a new regional director and team there, as well as LIDAM in, in the U.S. And so I think one of the things we, we do see that I think is unique here um, uh, is that there is this kind of magic mixture of um, both like a very productive and highly functioning economy, you know, met multiple economies, uh, as well as a, still a massive, um, a, a massive informal economy that actually is like from a percentage wise quite, quite a bit larger than most other places. It's close to um, some countries in Africa and, and, and India, but it, but again, the GDPs are quite higher in, in Latin America, largely for each country that we operate in. Um, so there's this kind of interesting mixture of, of um, both like a, a ton of capital and a ton of business going on, uh, as well as like a lack of systems and tools to support it. And so the opportunity to do um, uh, to do good, the opportunity to create systems and to create you know, for, uh, formalities uh, uh, around that economy in lots of different ways, whether it's agriculture or housing or uh, banking or credit access or these things um, is, is really pretty dramatic. Uh, and, and also we see this the scale of kind of global interest quite high compared to most other uh, markets similar in Africa. We're actually um, just embarking on raising a LATAM and an Africa-focused emerging market investment fund um, because we see a, a sim similar kind of global interest in those markets, as well as opportunity to really change millions of lives through investing in the kinds of companies that we're supporting here. Um, so I'd say uh, there are lots of uh, lots of similarities, lots of differences, but I think that's one that's one way in which I think about it. Um, the opportunity is is just grand and growing um, in ways that really eclipse most other markets in the world. So that's a that's a great point. So my last question to the group is, what do you see um, Latin America looking like in, say, 10 to 15 years? Uh, what is changing now that you're excited about? I hope it doesn't look the same. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, plenty of things are changing. I, mean, I think that um, as we've seen the number of startups and investment duplicating this space should continue and should create more opportunities. I think that we, I would like to see Latin America with equal access, more equal access to capital, to opportunities, so that this creative force of entrepreneurs can materialize and we can start seeing, the, and I've seen that there's a huge discussion in the, in the chat group related to uh, corruption and related to where and how we could create tools to have uh, the disruptive tools in order to separate corruption from regulation and create the environments, the necessary environments for, I mean, to attract capital, I think that, or at least I would like to see better access and contract enforcement and better regulation and, I mean, the, the basics that can assure investment, a secure path so that they can find LATAM opportunities creative. That would be my wishful thinking. I wish I could know how it's going to look like, but I don't. Great. Matt, Daniel? Any thoughts on the next 10 to 15 years and what you're excited yeah. about? Yeah, I can go next. And then uh, I'm interested about Matt's view on this one because he has experience in Latin America as well. Um, so uh, the first one would, would be access to opportunity, like Marina said. The other one is ending poverty. And I know that there are many root causes, most of what you know can be solved by entrepreneurs, but our systemic issues that are, uh, of course, as, as we see in the chat here. But I'm an optimist in the end, because entrepreneurs exist because of different failures or different opportunities in the system. And we see it today. There, are, there's, there's as long as there's an opportunity for us to make more visible and and make people uncomfortable with what is existing today. And as long as we share the vision and also 
the expectations that we have on them and entrepreneurs and you know really general public we have the chance to change this right and when you think of latin america yes you can think of corruption you can think think of different um issues that we have here and yes they, they exist but in the end these problems exist and we probably exist in latin america and other countries because it is part of you know the different dynamics but that shouldn't be an excuse for us not doing our best so when i think of latin america i see that entrepreneurs can help society eradicate poverty um, because that is what you know capital and also what private institutions are for in the end and i see latin america as a place where we can access uh, different opportunities and this is going to make a difference right when we have people like you know the ones that are mentoring for moody's they do it because they want to and not because they, they're, they're being forced to right and when we have more people like that and we have more people caring about what's happening with our families and our children whenever we have or not then that's going to change right so i would like to to think about it instead i like something that i've read in the chat that has to do with um, wherever wherever and however we want the future to look like we need good role models to follow so we should become or we should become the future that we want to see so thank you arman yeah, it's such a great, I, I think um, there's so many ways to, to answer that question about the future of, of the region. I think um, you, we're, just the amount of growth that we're seeing and the standards uh, and the ways in which I think m many of the, the, the national governments are really understanding the regulatory needs just to kind of make, create a better environment for business and to ensure that there's some consistency in that environment. Um, I think that's that, that's fairly quickly changing across many markets in Latin America. Um, and so I, I think um, uh, that one of the one of the beautiful things I think that's happening here that I think will play out over the next 15 years is that uh, when we think a lot about technology or, or innovation in like a Maslow's hierarchies um, kind of principle where there's, there's a lot of, in the U.S., in Silicon Valley and places like that, there's a lot of, um, money um, and time spent on luxuries, on the things that are at the top of that pyramid that are the small um, um, uh, problems that a very small number of people globally uh, face. Um, but in, 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 in economies like Latin America and startup communities particularly, uh, most of the activity in the capital is actually focusing on the things that change the most lives. So all of the things we've talked about here. Um, and so I, I think that, um, I think you're going to see, continue to see Latin America really lead in technology adoption and innovation and regulatory change and investment that is truly a new model. So a part of what we were thinking about with this panel was that it's it's really reinventing the way we think about this, the, the purpose of innovation and technology in people's lives to really dramatically improve the, the majority of people's lives, not the, not the wealthy elite only. Um, and that that's a very inverted way to think about technology and investment. Um, and I think we're, we're really um, uh, optimistic to use Daniel's term about um, this community in this region um, and, and our work together, even in that being a, being a grand part of helping that uh, to see that future become a reality. Great. So just to quickly recap what, what we've learned over the last 45 minutes, uh, no longer is it just emerging, LATAM is leading. Uh, Latin America is uniquely shaping entrepreneurship and venture capital driven by innovation that matters to society. And accessibility to entrepreneurship programming and capital remains a barrier to equitable distribution of economic opportunity. So Marina, Matt, Daniel, thank you so much uh, for joining today and for sharing all your words of wisdom. Uh, look forward to our next conversation together.